This is Floss Weekly. I'm Doc Searles. This week we have a round table, more like a triangular one, with myself, Jonathan Bennett, and Sean Powers, talking about all kinds of fun, interesting, new, and durable topics, such as uh, real-time Linux, whether or not uh, the Linux Foundation, because it's so well-funded by Microsoft, is is like captive to Microsoft, or whether Linux itself is captive to Microsoft or big companies. What's the role of big companies? Uh, all of that and a whole lot more is coming up next. Podcasts you love. From people you trust. This is Twit. This is Floss Weekly, episode 692. Recorded Wednesday, August 3rd, 2022. Sugar Free Hammer. This episode of Floss Weekly is brought to you by Compiler, an original podcast from Red Hat discussing tech topics big, small, and strange. Listen to Compiler on Apple Podcasts or anywhere you listen to podcasts. And by IRL, an original podcast from Mozilla. IRL is a show for people who build AI and people who develop tech policies. Hosted by Bridget Todd, this season of IRL looks at AI in real life. Search for IRL in your podcast player. Hello again, everybody, everywhere in the world you may be. I am Doc Searles. This is Floss Weekly. And this week, uh, we have a... A round table, which is actually more like triangular, although you're probably looking at it in a rectangle if you are. It's it's uh, it's myself and Jonathan Bennett and Sean Powers, um, our, our most expressive co-host. I would say <laughs> that was that was a polite oh, way to refer to me. I appreciate that. <laughs> no, I just think you, you you make faces. It's always very fun to watch. You know, and you you send you send advance images that showed that as well. But, uh, you know, your brain is Sean thing. Great and face for radio. Anyway. I've heard them all. Yeah, great fa- <laughs> I think we all have bad faces for radio. Let's uh, put it that way. So we'll start with you, Sean. I mean, what's, what's going on for you? Is like it- in general? Um, it's yeah, it's not a thousand degrees whatever. today. Uh, anybody who was here the last time I, I was on, uh, it was really hot and I was worried that my air conditioner would interrupt the, uh, the show. So I turned it off. And by the end of the show, my cheeks were beet red. I was drenched in sweat. And then it turned out that having the AC on didn't affect the show at all. So I could have just left it on. Yeah, it's, yeah. uh, I have one of those too. And I know Jonathan has already worked out his AC thing. It's turned up enough. I, so I he asked, and I can, yeah. Yeah, I asked and I was given special permission to leave the AC on. Uh, so if if it's too loud in the recording, don't send me the hate mail. <laughs> yeah, you do. Jonathan you have does have le- Yeah, and with the leather chair, I mean, he's got kind of a volcano the, layer vibe going. So you would need an chair. AC in the he's volcano layer. Chair. So I get it. Yeah, I, 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 he's got tall guy chair, so it just looks doesn't look so tall. In the, <laughs> but if you get, if you get hit. From behind, you've got the whiplash thing going on, right? You could. <laughs> These are people who have who have actually looking at us in the visual thing. There he is, and <laughs> instead of clutter in the background, I have my office set up. I have my office set up so that I am in the far side of the room, and there's not any entries behind me. So you'd have to work really hard to sneak up on me here. <laughs> yeah, that's that's good. I I I don't know. Do you guys? I. I sort of feel like, you know, like in, in old Westerns, but gamblers never want to sit with their back to the saloon door. That's sort of the way I feel about office space. I don't want my back to people coming in the room, which I do. I'm at the end of a, I'm in a basement. I'm in a far corner. Everything is behind me. So it's not working here. Are you, are you similarly minded or do you not care? I will sit in a restaurant. I'll look for a chair in the corner just because I've read too many, I've read too many Westerns and it, that thought is ingrained in my brain. And, and you're actually kind of, I'm you not. live in Oklahoma. So that's a, uh, it's true. It's, it's, it's a, it's, you still have wild catters there and people with titles like that. And uh, yes. Yeah. And, and part of it too, is that like people don't want you like in the old days, people didn't want you to see your cards. We don't want people to see our screens. Right. That's, that's another thing. It's like, if we're, it's part of it, yeah. we, we feel private about our 
externalizing whatever is going on in our heads. So, and it's funny we because have a, it's you know yeah, everybody yeah. assumes it's like oh what do you what's on your screen you're hiding and it's like you know dumb things like uh, probably don't want to see like the crocheting patterns I was looking up for a you know fun time with kids later and uh, yeah I just have. <laughs> Like, not inappropriate, just like, yeah, I don't really want to explain why that's there. <laughs> yeah, I just mostly think about, you know, my wife walking in when I'm, you know, doom school. You sure you want to finish? Um, We're live. A a Amazon, you know, or something. Yeah, there's that. Uh, but, um, you know, like, you know, quick bring email up, you know, <laughs> bring up the spreadsheet. <laughs> Anyway, I was, I was so working. really, I was. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, right. <laughs> I, I think actually most of us aren't most of the time in one way or another. So it's I, I just hated filling out timesheets when I had a, a job where I had to do that because you're basically faking it some percentage of the time. I think. Um, I wonder how many. <laughs> Not me. Are, in case my employer yeah, yeah. watches the show. <laughs> <laughs> Anyhow, um, so. So we've had a, our own back channel on this thing. And, and I want to start out by topically by bringing up something that Brian Lenduk, who's an old colleague of, of Sean's and mine at Linux Journal. Um, he worked for Linux Journal for a while. Um, uh, he sent on back in July 7th, but this is kind of a, a rolling thing. Um, Microsoft's growing control of Linux. He's worried that, you know, as Microsoft gets more and more involved with Linux and, and is very involved in, uh, you know, it owns GitHub and, um, and it owns, you know, uh, it, it contributes a great deal to Linux conferences and it, uh, contributes enormously to, um, uh, it, it's a platinum member, you know, a very top paying member of, um, of the, uh, of the Linux foundation, uh, which has provided many guests for us, by the way. And, uh, and I know I'll, I'll, I'll start out on this one and then turn it over to you guys. And we're going to have Miguel de Casa, who a, a father of GNOME and who works for Microsoft now. Um, and is, uh, he's going to be on in a few weeks. So I'll, that's a little advance um, notice about that. That'll be interesting. Um, but every time I've talked to somebody who's in the employ of a big company about their control of Linux, the response has always been a, it doesn't happen and B it's not possible even because we lead them rather than they lead us. In other words, because we're, and I'm thinking mostly by Linux kernel developers. Um, I'm thinking of Andrew Morton, Linux, uh, Linus himself, Ted show, um, others that I've spoken to in years past, uh, uh, a great crow Hartman, especially I want to get him on the show as well. Um, the kernel has to work for everybody, has to work for everything on earth and biasing it toward any one company, no matter how big they are, is just not a consideration. Um, but they work for these companies, right? So, so it seems, to, so I, I, I mentioned one more thing before I give it to you guys. Uh, Ellen Miller of, of the, of the, of the Sunlight Foundation years ago, they took space in a building that was owned by Google and Google helped them out in a number of ways. And I asked her, how do you avoid um, influence by Google? And she said, money always gives you influence. You can't say if you're getting money from somebody that it doesn't have influence. It does. It always does. We just have to do your best with it. So that's kind of another opinion there. So where were you guys on this thing? Um, I, I think, I just jumped in because I only have one good thing to say, and I'm afraid Jonathan might say something related to that. I'm out. Um, <laughs> <laughs> so I think that by, I don't think of it as bias. I think that you hire somebody to gain uh, prioritization, right? And, you know, the, there are a lot of things that a lot of people want into the Linux kernel or into any project. And when you put somebody on your payroll, what you're paying for is your, uh, your benefits to be prioritized, you know, based on, you know, we're paying you to, you know, do things in our best interest. And, and while I don't think it's, you know, necessarily evil and sabotaging other things, it gives the priority to the people who are paying the, you know, person's mortgage. So I, I that was, that's the entirety of my uh, vast insight on the topic. I just think it's a priority as opposed to bias. I don't think it's evil inherent. I think it's, um, you know, just how, how it goes. 
Yeah, I, I think Sean's got the right idea. So in, in thinking about this topic, I am reminded of that meme that says, well, yes, but actually no. Uh, so <laughs> it, would be, it would be pretty easy to imagine a, a really big business like, you know, uh, Microsoft, Facebook, Google, one of those guys that they, they measure their businesses in, in billions with a B. You could imagine them hiring up enough Linux devs. So let's, let's just think about the kernel. You could hi- you could imagine them hiring up enough Linux devs that they would have a sizable amount of influence, and I think it's worthwhile to maybe keep that in the back of your mind. That if you if you ever saw one of them moving in that direction, maybe wave the red flag. And the kernel particularly is is more immune to that because you have the Linux Foundation that is paying the. Uh, uh, you know, paying the salary of Torvalds and Torvalds, of course, is very opinionated. And if he saw something like that, he would go on an epic rant that we have not seen from him in quite a while. And it would be amazing. Um, but, you know, smaller projects, that's that's definitely a thing to keep in mind that you could have kind of a hostile takeover. But at the same time, like Sean said, so much of the time a, a business gets so much utility out of Linux the way it works now, it they would they would be poisoning their own well to try to really manipulate it. Um, but what you do see is Microsoft wants Linux to work well on the Azure cloud, and Amazon wants Linux to work well in AWS. And um, let's see, I don't have another really good example off the top of my head. Uh, uh, Google wants fun new things to come into Android, which is now based on Linux, and they want security patches for free from Linux. And so it makes sense for Google to hire engineers to work on Linux and work on the Linux and Android kernel coming back together. And so, yes, there are certain things that get prioritized. And in some of those cases, there are nudges. Hey, we want you, we're going to hire you as a Linux dev, and we want you to work on this specifically. I'm not aware, though, of any time when that's been done uh, secretly, right? Like, so if if Google hires a Linux dev and says, hey, we want you to get these patches. In fact, we have a story about this. We'll get to it here in a second. We want you to get these patches into the kernel. Well, that's kind of just about printed on the business card anymore, right? So when... um, when Intel bought the guys behind the real-time kernel, um, let's see, is it... uh, Oh, what's the name of the company? Linux Tronics. Um, I have it. I have it. One second. I'm I'm the one scrolling now. Uh, yeah, Linux Tronics. Um, they they these were the guys working on the real time kernel, and they put out a call back a few months ago and say hey, we're having trouble trying to fund this, and it wasn't too much longer after that Intel bought their company, and the next thing you know, you know those patches are again gathering steam and. We, we may see the core of real-time Linux uh, actually get merged. Like their, their patch count may go to zero uh, in this particular kernel that we, the merge window just started. And so, you know, it's, yeah, these guys, the, the, the Linutronics guys, they've got this as their stated goal and Intel bought them to continue working on that goal. And that's, that's, a, that's a good thing. Uh, you know, that gets that feature into the kernel for everybody. And so, I, I, again, there is some merit in being wary of big corporations in some cases. Um, but at the same time, they're, they're generally not going to poison their own well, which kind of keeps everybody safe. And you made a valid point about um, the Linux Foundation being great as a, a, not a direct gatekeeper, but you know, employing people so that the the people who do make the the commit decisions are not directly influenced. And even if they were, I don't think it's like the end of times. But um, that is a really nice layer of uh, of protection towards the top, if that makes sense. Because I mean, you know, if lots of you know high level devs are hired by different companies another company could hire another one to you know push their stuff and it's you know open source mm-hmm. is just that it's open and if somebody was trying to be um inherently evil and and making something not work for a competitor that's going to be so blatantly out in the open it'd be tough to make that stick all the way if that makes sense i i just think that 
Uh, there are too many checks and balances along the way. And thankfully, those checks and balances aren't all controlled by one for-profit company. I'll, I'll even go a step further and say it is a built-in check and balance that you have the Linux Foundation and you also have corporations. Corporations keep the Linux Foundation in check. Uh, and that's that may be kind of a surprising thing to think about, but there are uh, there are different priorities and different things that people care about and different political machinations going on. And it it is a subtle but present pressure that the Linux Foundation knows if we screw this up badly enough, uh, IBM and Red Hat could do a hard fork of the kernel <laughs> and people would go with them if we mess it up badly enough. And that's kind of that's kind of built into the GPL, into the, the definition of open source. If we screw this up badly enough, they will fork and the people will leave. And uh, that is that is a useful pressure to keep everybody on the same page and, and doing right. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, it's up point and fly too, right or else we'll fork. Yeah, because <laughs> I, I, while the, I, I, the I Linux Foundation a, isn't... Oh, go ahead, Doc. I'll, I'll go finish your thought and then I'll go to a separate I was just going to say, it is a really valid point too. While, you know, the Linux Foundation is, uh, seems inherently, you know, ideal to, you know, not, not have interests. Other, you know, the support by the big corporations, plural, is definitely a good thing because then they're not going to be influenced by one particular if multiple uh, large companies are um, supporting them. Yeah, that, that's a good point. And one I hadn't thought of, to be honest, Jonathan, is that, you know, the uh, who who watches the watcher sort of thing, right? And and it's good that it happens to be people with a vested interest. So, yeah. And go ahead, Doc. That was just Absolutely. my... Yeah. So I, I have a kind of a one-liner for what the Linux Foundation is, which is it's a club for giants and wannabe giants where they all go to not club each other. And... <laughs> Um, and I think that's actually what it is. It's kind of a United Nations of big things and want to be big things. plug for club twit. <laughs> yeah, right. <laughs> we, we can, hey, club twit is a place where, where geeks go to not club each other. Although probably they can. Um, they might be more willing and able to. But the, the, the interesting thing to me about the Linux Foundation, the more I look at it and the more I've hung out with people there and at, at conferences is that um, they, 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 it's all about what are, what are the common interests here that move a lot forward a lot faster and better when everybody's all looking out for that and not for whatever their parochial interests are. And it turns out that the common interests tend to be ones where, you know, you're going to, you're going to get your advantage somewhere else, you know, and that's fine. You know, I mean, um, you had a really good example earlier of AWS versus uh, Azure, right? Those, those are competing clouds. They both need the kernel to work well. Um, and, and Jonathan, you brought up IBM, um, a, a guy named, um, uh, uh Fry, F-R-Y-E. What was his first name? I'm, I'm blanking on it, but anyway, Mr. he worked at, uh, What's that? Mr. <laughs> Mr. <laughs> we called him Mr. Fry. Anyway, uh, uh, he worked at IBM for many years and he told, he told me this is back in the early aughts that it took IBM six years to discover that they couldn't tell their kernel developers what to do, that it was actually the other way around. You know, the, the guidance actually worked the other way. You, you, you hire these people because they're the best at what they do and they're busy contributing gravity for everybody that, it's going to build on it and you really need to hear from them what what's actually going on and what's right rather than what's advantaged for you so i think that i think that's i think it's a workable system no matter how much these guys spend on on keeping the foundation going and i mean well like yeah, and yeah go ahead there, there's there's kind of a, another competitive pressure there when it comes to the individual developers um one of these guys or a high level linux contributor so if he goes to IBM and IBM tries to tell him, you're going to push this, he goes, there's 15 other companies that will pay me, gladly pay me as much as you are paying me. Why should I stay here if you're going to try to boss me around? You know, here, here's the way this is going to work. I'm going to work on the kernel. You can have some input. And if that's not okay, then I'm going, I'm leaving IBM and I'm going to Amazon or Google or Facebook or Netflix or 1700 other companies that would love to have a high level Linux dev on their staff. 
Yeah. And if you're paying, so, you know, if you're paying a high level dev, it's not just so that they they do your bidding, right? I mean, they offer value in why that is or isn't ideal or why it should happen. I mean, you know, they're they're high level for a reason. They're they're knowledgeable. They're intelligent. They see a bigger picture. And so, you know, I I think that the hopefully the threat of you know job hopping doesn't come up. Although it certainly is a you know an overarching maybe. Uh, guard against uh, upper level management stepping on them too hard. Yeah, well, there's there's a lot of these things, and uh, this is this is kind of just the way the economy as a whole works. Um, there are a lot of these threats that are you don't have to you don't have to state them. Like I don't I I really doubt that that conversation would ever happen. But you know everybody's got it in the back of their mind, like way 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 in the back of their mind. There's, there's 15 other job offers. All I have to do is just send one email and somebody else will hire me. And so it, with a lot of these things, it's not something that you ever have the tense meeting. Uh, you better stop this or else. Uh, but just it, it's just kind of that subtle pressure that everybody knows about that keeps everybody in line. Uh, let's see, what, what's the term they use in psychology? The, a social contract. There's, there's, a, there's a social contract for, for developers and how they get paid too. I bet some of those actual contracts are fairly complicated and, and highly mm -hmm. debated before a high level developer is hired too, because, you know, I've, I've seen a lot of legalese contract documents and they want you to commit to things that are silly if you don't push back. So I, I imagine there's a lot of uh, negotiation that goes on before those hires even take place. So, yeah. yeah. yeah I, I I just on our own little back channel, I shared a link to the Cloud Native Computing Foundation, which is um, uh, run by the by the uh, Linux Foundation. It's confusing because Linux Foundation has like a whole lot of foundations, so they're like subsidiaries in a way. But it's a lot of big companies all getting together, and it, they actually have it. I don't have a, a link for it, but they have a way of looking at all of these ones working together on this and. And you can actually subtract out the non-open source um, and highlight the open source parts of it. Because some of what people bring to it are not open source and you can kind of see what is and what isn't. But it is, it is, it is a club. <laughs> and so that's what, that's what that's about. I want to, we have more topics to go to and, and uh, Jonathan teased one, I don't think, specifically a moment ago. So trust me, it'll be good. But first I have to let you know that this episode of Floss Weekly is brought to you by Compiler, an original podcast from Red Hat discussing tech topics, big, small, and strange. Compiler comes to you from the makers of Command Line Heroes, another of our sponsors, and is hosted by Angela Andrews and Brent Simino. Technology, they say, can be big, bold, bizarre, and complicated. Compiler unravels industry topics, trends, and the things you've always wanted to know about tech through interviews with the people who know it best. On their show, you'll hear a chorus of perspectives from the diverse communities behind the code. They bring together a curious team of red hatters to tackle big questions in tech, like what is technical debt? What are tech hiring managers actually looking for? And do you have to know how to code to get started in open source? <laughs> I'm living proof of that. <laughs> the only code I know is Morse. Anyway, episode two covers what can video games teach us about edge computing? The internet is a patchwork of international agreements and varying infrastructure, but there is something coming to change the ways we connect. In this episode of Compiler, hosts expose what edge computing could mean for people who enjoy video games and what this form of entertainment could teach us about the technology. Episode nine is how are tech hubs changing? Traditionally, if someone wanted a career in tech, they had to make the move to a tech hub, a city packed with startups and talent, but things are starting to change. The hosts of Compiler speak to a few of the change makers who are thinking outside of the physical and social dimensions we've come to associate with innovation. And by the way, my own life was shaped by the need to go to the tech hub called Silicon Valley from North Carolina, which is not yet a tech hub and is where Red Hat is now. So there's kind of a full circle there. Learn more about Compiler at red.ht slash twit. New episodes are out now. Go and download them at any time and be sure to check back for new shows. 
Listener Compiler and Apple Podcasts or anywhere you listen to podcasts will also include a link on this episode's show page. My thanks to Compiler for their support. So, Jonathan, you teased us. <laughs> what was that? Or did you already hit on it? I'm not sure. I, I think I, I covered it. We can go a little deeper into it. Um, the real-time patches for the Linux kernel. <clears throat> and this is one of those things where, you know, a, a big company, Intel, has come in and said, we, we would really like this to happen. Uh, so, uh, real-time computing is the idea that when you ask your computer to do something, you can guarantee that it is going to take exactly this much amount of time to complete it. And if you ask it to do something else that you say is more important, you can also guarantee that the more important thing is going to get done in that amount of time, uh, no matter what else is going on. And so this is, uh, this is really important for certain use cases, like if you have a computer that's controlling your car, maybe. So I imagine engineers at Tesla care a lot about this. Um, if you're using a computer to control a spaceship, <laughs> let's say, so people at NASA care about this. Um, but it also matters if you're using your computer to do multimedia. So like if you're doing audio processing in real time, being able to guarantee that those audio packets are ready when it's time for them to go out the speaker. Because if it's time for the packet to go out the speaker and the audio is not done processing yet, well, you, you get bad results. Very, very ugly sounds come out instead. And so... It, it, the real-time patch is this idea of a real-time kernel. It has, it has use for a whole lot of people, a whole lot of situations. And in the past, the Linux kernel has just not had the capabilities to really truly do it. And there's been this patch set floating around for, I think, a couple of years now. Um, but it's not quite been ready to go. And with this, again, the, the Linux kernel, the merge window for... 5.20, which is almost certainly going to be called 6.0, uh, just opened. And the goal, of, uh, several people have mentioned, the goal for the real-time patch set is to get the outstanding patch count down to zero. Essentially merge all the patches so that you can, with the new kernel version, you can say, hey, run this in real time and it'll actually work. And of course, God only knows how many drivers is going to break as a result of that, but <laughs> that's part of the fun. <laughs> Uh, drivers. So I'm going to grab that as a segue <laughs> then, because uh, the thing that uh, one of the things I wanted to talk about is, uh, are you guys familiar with uh, the Intel Arc GPUs, like their discrete GPUs that are not quite out in the public, but are starting to leak out to reviewers? I'm not one of those reviewers, sadly, but um, <laughs> it's kind of like the oddly Intel being the new kid in the in the block, but with uh, discrete GPUs that like are comparable to nvidia amd uh, gpus it's actually pretty cool and oh yeah and that's so that's the the other part of the story <laughs> when we when we ask the question about like uh, what are your thoughts on blockchain um yeah intel is trying to make them not uh, not crypto friendly but i think uh, you know that's a again this is a, a side a side note, but I think it's just a matter of time, right? I mean, the way GPUs are designed, they are ideal for the kind of computation that most cryptocurrencies uh, require. So just like NVIDIA trying to make their uh, their cards crypto unfriendly, that was worked around in short order. So I don't I don't think there's much hope for that, but it's pretty neat to see somebody new um, with real, uh, you know, gaming class hardware that's coming out and intel has historically been pretty uh great with linux i'm a little bit nervous because like there were no for the testers like the people who are testing them now uh there aren't any drivers apparently however there are some uh some references and some kernel modules i guess and i can't even tell you the the name of the uh the cards but uh it's there are kernel modules that are being developed for the the new not yet released intel gpu so i'm excited about that and the big thing I'm excited about um, is that uh, they do AV1 encoding. I, are you are you guys uh, video encoding nerds at all, or no? Just just a little bit. Um, and a lot of my video encoding nerddom comes actually from working with security cameras, um, because trying to get really good video from a security camera without murdering your CPU on your server is a difficult thing. So just a little bit. AV1 is. Uh, it's the competitor to H.265, I think. 
So, yeah, I mean, there's a long, there's a long, long story there. But the issue with H.265, there's nothing wrong with it, except that it is, um, you know, it's, it's, it's licensed, covered. right? You have to pay for the yeah. encoder. And so, um, yeah, the AV1 is that same generation as sort sort of as VP9 that, you know, YouTube is using right now uh, for the bulk of their stuff. But the idea is that it's completely open and it's it's backed by all of the big companies. I mean, from Apple to Google to, you know, everybody is backing AV1 as an open standard for video. But also there's going to be an AV1 image codec uh, that's going to be open and I imagine, you know, extremely high quality for for low um for low file size as well. So I'm I'm actually looking forward to it. But the thing that is specific about um the new discrete GPUs is that when it comes to AV1, they've leapfrogged like NVIDIA. Um because NVIDIA has AV1 decoding on their 3000 series, like the RTX 3000 series cards have uh, hardware decoding of AV1, but the new Intel cards that are not yet, I, I know, but soon, uh, have AV1 hardware encoding, which is pretty significant. So um, I'm I'm really looking forward to what that will mean, uh, especially since it's, you know, the, the whole idea of the codec is uh, being open and historically Intel video stuff has been pretty Linux friendly. So I'm hoping for some awesome things there. Yeah, so I have been I have been told, and I cannot cite the source on this secondhand, but it's somebody that knows the industry well. Um, I've been told that the problem with Intel Arc right now is the drivers. They are having trouble. Mm -hmm. And one of the big problems is uh, the, so Intel has done GPU cores on the CPU for years now. And apparently it was more of a big deal than they expected to put those GPU cores out at the end of a PCI Express bus. And uh, that apparently caused more problems than was anticipated. And they're still trying to engineer around some of those issues. <laughs> so, yeah, if you look that, at the other link, is, it, it mentioned yeah, that specifically, like some of the, uh, you know, the other the other big companies have a, a bit of a leap start, obviously, because they've been making discrete video cards in the PCIe slots. And um, so, yeah, they're they're trying to figure that out. I, I'm. I mean, I'm confident that they will, right? I mean, like I said, there's already some references in the um, in the kernel for the the new line of art cards. But I mean, this is their first release, and as amazing as the ability for uh, video encoding, especially, are, I'm I'm excited for what the future. Plus, I mean, having a, another player in the GPU market is awesome. I mean, that rather than just having the two, I'm pretty excited about that. So, yeah, I'm, I'm stoked. I hope that I get to test one someday. Uh, it probably means I'll have to buy one and then I can test it. But uh, nonetheless, I'm hoping that it's a, <laughs> it's good. And to be honest, I'm not a gamer at all. So I know that the big focus is going to be um, the big focus is going to be gaming, you know, because that's, you know, GPUs gaming. But um, yeah, we'll see. For hardware encoding of video is where I'm excited about for video editing, for live streaming. I mean, live streaming in AV1 in like 1080p, 60 frames per second, or even 4K, ideally with AV1. It's so um, highly encoded. Yeah, I'm just excited about it. Yeah, so Pharonix has some coverage on this. And uh, in Linux, the, you've got to remember when we talk about these driver problems, that's probably a reference more likely to Windows. Uh, I, I don't know that Intel would hold a hardware release for a Linux driver problem. But anyway, uh, talking about Linux, uh, Pharonix has coverage that uh, Mesa 22.2, which is just now hitting feature freeze. So we're still um, probably about a month away from seeing that fully release. And then Linux 5.20, which again, a couple of months away from seeing that release. That is where full support for the Intel Arc cards is going to land. And, and so... Yeah, it's still it's still real early. It's it would be real early to get your hands on one of these pieces of hardware and expect it to work. Um, so you know we're we're looking at the next iteration of of distros. Um, you know we're all running what Fedora thirty six now, and it'll be Fedora thirty seven to thirty eight. So uh, a few months away before the all of those issues and all of that support lands and get straightened out. So somebody send me a card. I'll test it when we can with the current versions, <laughs> see how crappy it is and then how much <laughs> better it's going to be afterwards. <laughs> yes. Uh, I'll take you up on that. Sounds, sounds yeah. good. Uh, 
Sometimes that works. Not very often. <laughs> All right, I have got uh, I have got a story that I think is going to be real interesting. Um, this this kind of made some waves online, and it's all about again we mentioned Fedora. Fedora is outlawing a open source license in their distro, and we're going to talk about that. But I think Doc has something to tell us first. <laughs> I have to cue it. Smooth. Cue, that I is, mean, I ruined that it. Is that is smooth. smooth. <laughs> it'd be it'd be even more smooth if I actually had what I was going to tell us queued up, but now I do. That is this episode. I'll take that again. This episode of Floss Weekly is brought to you by IRL, an original podcast from Mozilla. IRL is a show for people who build AI and people who develop tech policies. Hosted by Bridget Todd. This season of IRL looks at AI in real life. Who can AI help? Who can it harm? The show features fascinating conversations with people who are working to build more trustworthy AI. For example, there's an episode about how our world is mapped with AI. The data that's missing from those maps tells as much of the story as the maps themselves. You'll hear all about the people who are working to fill those gaps and take control of the data. There's another episode about gig workers who depend on apps for their livelihood. It shows how they're pushing back against algorithms that control how much they get paid and seeking new ways to gain power over data to create better working conditions. For political junkies, there's an episode about the role that AI plays when it comes to the spread of disinformation around elections, a huge concern for democracies around the world. And another episode explains the role that AI plays when it comes to elections and the spread of misinformation and hate speech. And, you know, we all we are all living in a world of AI right now. And it always strikes me is that there's there's the unknown unknown. And that's kind of where we have to be concerned. So there's a really great podcast for that. You can search for IRL in your podcast player. We also include a link in the show notes. My thanks to IRL for their support. So we're back. <laughs> so, yes. So, so there's this saying. there's this story. Yeah, there's this story that made the rounds and uh, kind of made some waves. And that is the the Fedora Steering Committee said, "Hey, we are going to disallow Creative Commons Zero from for software." And that's an important note in the Fedora distro. And so, you know, this, this obviously raised a lot of questions. Well, why would, why would the Fedora guys do this? What exactly does CC0 say? What's going on here? All right, let's take it apart. CC0 is the Creative Commons license that essentially says no rights reserved. It is a license that intends to take the thing that you have put together and just put it out as close to public domain as possible. And it is not intended for code. And that's one of the important points here. In fact, none of the Creative Commons licenses are intended to be used for source code. They are all intended to be used for uh, pictures, for media, the creative text, yeah, for media. Uh, you know, you can write a novel and put it in CC0, that's fine. You can write documentation and put it in CC0, and that's fine. Um, so the the link that we've got to this, whether you check it out in the show notes or you can just Google it, is actually off to Hackaday. Um, you don't think of Hackaday as being, you know, a, a place to talk about licensing issues, but Tom Nardi wrote this one up and did a great job talking about it. And essentially, Fedora says... Because CC is not intended for source code and because CC0 has no patent protection in it, we're not going to allow new software that is Creative Commons Zero licensed to get used. And I thought that was really interesting that one of the things that Fedora is really concerned about is this submarine patent issue where someone has a patent, writes code that uses the patent and doesn't tell anybody about it and then releases it as CC0, gets it pushed into something like Fedora, and then a couple of years down the line sues and said, you're violating our patent, which surely no one would ever do that. Well, we've seen some, some nasty behavior like that in certain corners in the past. Um, I won't name any names, but uh, <clears throat> there was a, a handset manufacturer that got sued by a big company not too long, it's been several years ago. Anyway, um, and so the, the 
bigger question that people in the Hackaday comments at least were asking was, why did Fedora ever allow CC0 code into their distro, which I thought was a, a pretty on point question. And then there's there's another direction that we can go with this, and that is, well, wait a second, isn't the GPL doesn't the GPL three exist because the GPL v two doesn't have sufficient patent protection in it, and uh, isn't the Linux kernel that we all know and love written and licensed under the GPL v two? <laughs> Are we in trouble here? <laughs> uh, do do one of you guys have any thoughts? I can continue going, but uh, you have any thoughts on uh, this this patent question? I think the you know specifically for CC zero, I think it it probably you know why did they ever it probably just never occurred to me. Why do people why would people license their code with that uh, unless you know they're doing something sneaky? I guess probably nobody thought about it. like I mean I guess sure you can make your code in CC zero. It's weird, but whatever. Not thinking like what some ramifications are, and maybe the ramification, maybe the the initial intent wasn't to be, you know, potentially creepy. Uh, but I mean, it's kind of like you know, you don't sell hammers as sugar free. It just doesn't make sense, right? And so, <laughs> it's it certainly, you know, I don't think that this is a, you know, this shouldn't be controversial that they're saying, you know, we can't do CC zero uh, licensed code in Fedora. That it just makes sense, right? Uh, the GPL two part is a little bit stickier, I guess. <laughs> but um, yeah, I, 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 it's weird that any code was ever licensed with CC zero, you know, hopefully that it was never done with ill intent, maybe because it's simple, people would just thought, Oh, simple is best. And I just, you know, want to be simple. I don't know. But it makes sense that they said no, because it's just weird. Yeah, it, so me. it's and just whispered yeah, in our ear that uh, some developers think that their code is art. And maybe that's why they wanted to use Creative maybe Commons so. for it. Because it's art, right? <laughs> well, yeah. It. So my code might be art because it certainly isn't functional as code. So maybe that's really, <laughs> uh, maybe it was me. Maybe it's my fault. <laughs> There's a, uh, uh, um, and, and we might, it might be interesting to have Larry Lessig, who's one of the founders of, uh, of um, Creative Commons on the show at some point. He, he, uh, he also wrote, you know, Code is Law, and a whole bunch of books that are close to the topic here. But I remember at the beginning with Creative Commons, they did not have, at least for a while there, a public domain license. Um, and the idea was that you can't license what you're throwing out there. It's just not, doesn't work. Um, and he advised me when I started posting stuff online that I wanted basically close to public domain. Don't use that. Use one of the other ones, you know, require attribution or some, some other thing like that. And, um, but now it's back there and it's there. And, and that's, that's an interesting thing. Another is that there, there are these sort of overlapping topics. There's licensing, um, which creative commons concerns itself with. There's copyright. Um, there's patents, which is all about property, but, and then there's, um, and then there's contract and contracts. Another thing, it's an agreement between any two parties, but that plays into things as well, because companies especially concern themselves with all of those things. And, and there's a VIN with them, there's an overlap. And I think that's probably what happened in this case where, whether it was the art of it or not. I mean, a weird thing that I've run across, we all have, I think with open sources, there's this assumption that if you're open sourcing something, you're kind of throwing it out there for everybody to use, not for everybody to work on and improve. And there's a difference in that. And when you, you know, the reason we have open source licenses, licenses is so people can work on the code and work on that code for purposes that are imagined going forward and where you want to keep, keep certain, you know, rights and, you know, and so forth operative. And, but when you say open source, you know, it's kind of like people say, use about democracy. It's becoming, my, my father used to say, if, if a, a machine wasn't cooperating, it was being democratic. He didn't mean that there were electors in it, but he, he just meant that as it was sort of chaotic. But there's this assumption that if you put something in the world, you're opening it, and then now you can step away from it and anybody can use it. And, and it's not, it's not like that. I don't know if I clarified yeah, we, anything when I just, with what I just said, but yeah. Oh no! You kind of you kind of opened it up and, and made the point that this is a, yeah. a bigger issue. So we've we've got a uh, 
actually a, a pretty interesting comment here in the chat room. It's, it's Retcon5, and he says, Linus has stated that he didn't like the anti tvoization clause in GPLv3 because it fundamentally changes the GPL. The whole point and purpose of the GPL in Linus's mind right. is to make users of the GPL software pay back to the community by making all of their improvements uh, of the GPL available to the community under the same terms. That's it. With anti tvoization GPLv3 adds a completely new obligation that has nothing to do with this fundamental purpose. And uh, that's that's an interesting point. So when they went from GPLv2 to v3, it not only added the stronger patent, anti-patent protections, it also added this anti tvoization clause, which essentially that's the clause that says if you use this software you have to it's it's a right to repair essentially they they would have called it right to repair if that term had existed at the time uh, you have to give people the ability to get into it and make modifications and that's a bitter pill to swallow for a lot of companies and in some cases that's also a security problem you know if you've got a device that the whole point of it is you're only allowed to modify it in the certain ways that make sense from a security perspective then gpl v3 may be a non-starter for you and, and and that's certainly fascinating to think about um in doing the research i i did um i did come across some legal thinking about the gpl v2 that says that there is an implied patent license in there um, but it's just not made explicit. And so one of the other things they wanted to do when they went to the GPLv3, when they rewrote it, is they wanted to make the patent grant explicit with the thought that it would hold up better in court. Whereas V2, it was kind of a weak, implicit case. And uh, hopefully, hopefully, <laughs> hopefully we don't ever have to have that fight over the uh, Linux kernel. Um, we'll see. Why don't we pause well, for a minute and, and talk about what, what TiVoization exactly meant? So you go for what anti TiVoization is. Yeah, I think Jonathan was, touched on it. it would, what it would mean yeah. in that, you know, no. the, the code couldn't be locked down. You would have to give people access to it. I mean, go ahead. So you was, definitely was have a better grasp like, than I'm me. trying to get to where, where TiVo is at. I mean, TiVo is what invented the DVR, basically, the, the, the digital the, the video recorder. Right. And um, yeah, so you get TiVo stuff and they were very early user of Linux or they, they, they used Linux in their thing. So what would exactly happen there? Were they the good well, guys, the bad guys or what? I, you know, a lot of these a lot of these cases, it's real difficult to call somebody a good guy or a bad guy. Um, so TiVo built, as you said, their DVR and it has a hard drive in it and it runs Linux and you record your TV shows onto it. And the question then comes, well, what happens when that hard drive dies? Or what happens when you want to back your, uh, your TV shows up and be able to watch them on your desktop instead of your TV? Or, you know, what happens if there's this killer feature that you want on your TiVo and it doesn't support it? Well, it runs Linux. I should be able to go in there and add it, right? And on the TiVo, they actually used, I, I believe, signed firmware, essentially meant you couldn't run your own firmware on the TiVo. You couldn't put, you know, your own distro of Linux on that hard drive and boot it. It would refuse to boot. And that sort of raised the hackles of people. And, you know, perhaps rightly so. It's my hardware. I should be able to run whatever code I want to on it. So that's an argument to be made. Um, and it, it raised enough hackles that this idea of anti-TiVoization came to mean it's my hardware. I should be able to run whatever code on it I want to. And that got enough momentum that it was included in the GPL v3. And like I say, for some particularly security instances, that's maybe not always what you want. Uh, it, it, it's a tricky issue. It, it really is. Because on the one hand, I, I very much see the argument of if I own that and ownership means what it has always historically meant, then my ownership of that device means that I run whatever code I want to on it. And on the other hand, I absolutely see the argument of, well, if my phone is going to remain secure against, you know, pick your three letter agency, plugging their, their, their tools into it and just snarfing all of the data off of it, there has to be some layer of signed firmware. And so these things are kind of intention and it, remains to be seen the perfect solution for making them work out together. 
And I don't know, was was the hardware locking part of it? Because uh, as somebody who had an early TiVo, uh, when everybody thought that they were actually still going to be very successful, um, you could buy them with very small, I mean, they came with ridiculously small hard drives. And the idea, not even using different firmware, but just putting the exact same firmware on a larger or different hard drive if it failed, uh, was just uh, without doing really shady stuff, um, very difficult because the, the hard drives were locked in some weird way that you had to like uh, get some weird key and unlock them and then create an image. It was really a bizarre situation. And I don't know if that was all part of it or not, but um, yeah, they, they certainly uh, pushed the envelope of what you should and shouldn't and can and can't do with with Linux. And there are some uh, links in the that uh, Redcon 5 gave us in the in the chat as well that are i'm going to look at it after the fact i'm not going to read it now because you know i have a job to do but yeah i never had a tivo and so i'm i'm just kind of putting together the pieces from the different things i've read about it i never tried to go down that road of hacking uh, but looking looking at the documentation it looks like they used digital code signing and unless you were running a firmware package that was signed it simply would not boot on the tivo yeah mm -hmm. And Burke mentions that it's still the best. Honestly, yeah, TiVo is one of those weird, you know, people use it as a, as a marketing example all the time. This is outside of the scope of the show. But yeah, it's the best, most amazing interface, best quality. And yet it's just it's just a weird story about the TiVo in general. But the hardware lock was weird. I, you know, I bought mine with a it came with a 20 gigabyte drive. And that's not a whole lot of that's not a whole lot of data. And I could get a bigger hard drive. And I did. And boy, was that ever tough to just copy the same firmware. It wasn't even hacked firmware. It was just trying to get the same stuff running on a different drive. So, you know, it, well, I'm, it I'm sure. It, yeah. I, I was just going to say, I'm sure yeah. the issue there with TiVo was DRM, right? It, it was, yeah. well, people are going to have these, this copyrighted video and uh, we don't want to build something that's going to bring the ire of Hollywood and ABC, NBC, CBS down on our heads. We cannot win that court case. We do not have a, enough money to defend ourselves. So we're going to lock this down so that no one can commit, uh, you know, copyright violation, which is yeah, maybe that's that's weak sauce, issue. though. I mean, Mr. Rogers made, you know, the uh, VCR uh, case for recording shows and, and time shifting. And yeah, I, I think that that's kind of a weak sauce argument. Yeah, sure. You know, the digital recording was all brand new um, and maybe some of the channels, you know, they are. Uh, DRM protected channels that TiVo does get around. I don't know. We're kind of getting down a rabbit hole here, I guess. But um, yeah, it's <laughs> this is why there's you know contention, right? I mean, this is why it's a it's an issue because it's complicated. Um, I think. I mean, I'm, I'm thinking of other things of uh, uh, SVGA versus HDMI. There are people who worked on SVGA. I think it was SVGA being open versus HDMI being entirely an industry thing. Um, but I'm not familiar with that argument that much. Would it? Would we? But we need to close because I think we're we're yeah. pretty close to out of time. So so um, any 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 stones we've left unturned in uh, in uh, turns we've left unstoned in the course of this hour, <laughs> dudes. <laughs> Oh, I'm sure. I'm yeah, sure we could continue on this conversation I mean, for another hour, but we would likely get ourselves in even more trouble than we're already yeah. in. <laughs> yeah, I mean, I'm going to go get sugarfreehammer.com reserved because, I mean, that's like my next <laughs> band name. But apart from that, I got nothing. <laughs> I like that sugarfree hammer. Uh, uh, <laughs> I'm thinking of several I, band I names. Like, I can't say because we can't be profane. Damn. <laughs> <laughs> so on the Discord, Ilag says we each need to ask each other what our favorite script editor, uh, scripting language and text editor are. Oh, okay. Vimbash. Uh, <laughs> oh, Vimbash. <laughs> there you go. Sean's is easy. Uh, for me, it's probably Nano and Python these days. Uh, there are a bunch of scripting languages that I enjoy, but Python is the one I turn to most often these days. Doc, what I, about I you? Know. <laughs> me, well, uh, for me, I, it, uh, a VI, but not a. Uh, I don't. I don't script anything. So I mean, I, I just uh, edit text. So VI as far pros, as I, VI as far and as pros, I eh? 
<laughs> yeah, VI in prose. Yeah, VI in Jonathan, handwriting. <laughs> I don't know how old you are, but I feel like like Vimbash and then Nano Python was like a Gen X slash millennial divide there. I feel you made me feel old because, <laughs> I mean. Wow. Yeah. I can tell you exactly why I use Nano. I, I figured it out a couple of years ago. My first programming experience was QBasic using, it's essentially the, the old Microsoft DOS edit program with the QBasic language added to it. So I grew up editing text documents and editing code in Microsoft edit. And what's the editor that looks almost exactly like that? Uh, not almost exactly, but it looks most similar to that. Well, it's Nano. And that is why I'm most comfortable there. Fair enough. I learned programming on Turbo Pascal on an IBM 8086. So I'm old. <laughs> no, I've, I've got all you guys. I haven't even going how, how far elder both you, Doc's like I stacked you, rocks and, and you liked guys it. together. You're not as old as I am. So, <laughs> oh my gosh. Well, guys, it's wow. <laughs> you've used another really fun hour on Floss Weekly, and we will be back uh, next week with um, uh, let's see, making sure this um. Yeah, Avi Press, the CEO of Scarf, um, he's coming up next week. So that's coming, and yeah, there you go. So see you next can week. I plug my, can I plug my course? I oh, want you to plug, plug something, plug, man. Oh, my gosh. I, I just assumed we plugged all through this thing. Go plug. No. <laughs> Uh, I got nothing. No, just kidding. <laughs> <laughs> uh, no, just on my YouTube channel. Over here. Yeah, just my YouTube <laughs> channel. Uh, the Linux Plus course that I, I recently started is, is going. It's going to be pretty awesome, I think. It'll be the complete Linux Plus uh, course, and we can learn together. There is a guy that looks just like me. And um, <laughs> yeah, that's it. That's all I have. Yeah, <laughs> I looked up at the wrong time and I heard Sean talking and I saw Sean's mouth moving and they weren't matching up. It's very yeah, confused. No, it's, uh, <laughs> like, Sean, check your mic, buddy. <laughs> uh, so I will I will plug uh, hackaday.com to make sure and to check out every Friday morning. The security column goes live, all kinds of fun stuff there. And then the Untitled Linux show on the Twit Plus Discord. And uh, if you're not a member of Twit Plus yet, get with it. We hope to see you there. Fantastic, guys. Okay, so I've ended this once already. I'll do it again. Thanks, everybody. Come back next week. We'll see you then. Hey, I'm Rod Pyle, Editor-in-Chief of Ad Astra Magazine, and each week I join with my co-host to bring you This Week in Space, the latest and greatest news from the final frontier. We talk to NASA chiefs, space scientists, engineers, educators, and artists, and sometimes we just shoot the breeze over what's hot and what's not in space, books, and TV. And we do it all for you, our fellow true believers. So whether you're an armchair adventurer or waiting for your turn to grab a slot in Elon's Mars rocket, join us on This Week in Space and be part of the greatest adventure of all time.